Welcome back to part two for our protocol training. Now, hopefully you have the app downloaded to your phone. There have been a few people, um, usually those with older iPhones that had some difficulty downloading this. So what I would recommend is download the PDF at least. You, you wanna have these protocols somewhere readily available on your phone so you can access them, them, access them quickly. Uh, so as we dive into it, again, Basically, all these different agencies, all the medical directors, they got together. They wanted to make one centralized type protocol, which is great. Um, however, <clears throat> the biggest downside is the way that they've reformatted these protocols, I think. They are very tough to navigate, especially compared to what we're used to. Okay, So, again, most of the training for you is going to be just refamiliarizing yourself with the layout and at least be able to quickly reference the protocols that you want to dive into, okay? Within these protocols, you're going to see uh, this little teddy bear there. That teddy bear is going to represent anything pediatric, okay? If you see a lightning bolt, that's going to represent electricity, like cardioversion, um, pacing, defibrillating. Now, uh, we discussed in part one the per-local protocols. Remember, this is all agency-specific. For my agency, we're only going off of the uh, that seizure protocol that we have in place. These are those tabs I'm talking about. If you were to have the paper booklet and you can scan through them, there's going to be, I don't know, I think there's 10 or 11 pages maybe that look something like this. Uh, with the PDF version, I could click on those blue uh, lines and it'll pop me right into that protocol if I'd like to. Um, of course, with the app, you would be looking for general policies and guide, guidance and these are the ones that are going to pop up for you. With the universal care, this is all your standardized stuff. Um, they lay out what universal care means here, and then on pretty much every protocol, you're going to see universal care listed there. Um, now, the biggest thing, that, most of that's going to be like your ABCs, uh, BSI scene safety, um, just your general stuff, supportive care. Okay. However, with the pediatrics, you can see the teddy bear here to the right, with the highlight use commercially available tool for weight estimate. Okay, so whatever you're using, whether it's a Brazo tape, a Copa card, some other form of a cheat sheet, okay, make sure that you uh, make a comment in your narrative that you used such and such resource, okay? That way, if your chart ever gets pulled, um, people know where you're coming up with these weights, where are you coming up with these uh, drug dosages, okay? <clears throat> Or if you did everything based off a of formula, then go with the formula. You know, using that old PALS standard of eight plus two times the age, that would give you your kilos, and then everything is weight-based here. With our airway management under supportive care, uh, again, we should always be monitoring end titles when we have an airway involved, uh, especially advanced airways. It's a guarantee you must have end title on there. Um, IV IO access, uh, we'll talk about IOs a little bit later. Uh, try to obtain 12 leads. There's a whole list of reasons why you need to do a 12 lead later in these protocols. I mean, jokingly, pretty much everybody nowadays should get a 12 lead. Uh, another note here with the kids, again, commercially available tool for medication, dosing, and equipment size. Again, just is it a Brazo tape, Copa card, anything else you may have in there. There's a couple little references throughout these protocols, like the pediatric assessment triangle. Again, we're only going to hit the highlights in here. <clears throat> we're not going to really hit every line of every protocol. Okay. If there's something you want to do that's not written out, again, get on the phone, call medical direction. Okay. Remember, you have a scope of practice that's much broader than these protocols. Um, but these protocols are, for the most part, almost all of them are offline. Okay. When we talk about refusals, just a quick review on this. <clears throat> of course, they must be an adult, 18 or older. If they're emancipated, they've got to have documentation, just like that power of attorney or DNRs. Uh, and they can't be altered. They can't be under the influence of drugs and alcohol. Uh, they must be able to make uh, uh, decisions for themselves. Okay, And of course, they can't be suicidal or homicidal, You know, a harm to themselves or others. Those high-risk refusals, ones that we really should have online medical direction with. Okay. Um, for whatever reason, if someone's trying to refuse, maybe they're impaired, um, not the best decision making, okay? If we've given any kind of medications that are there to alter their rate control, dysrhythmias, blood pressure, so let's say we're giving them pressors, 
Maybe you gave them adenosine or cardizem to convert a rhythm. Um, we really shouldn't be letting those people refuse. They really should be evaluated at the hospital. But again, if they're awake, alert, answering all your questions, um, and they can pretty much refuse whenever they want, right? We can't kidnap them. If you were to pick up a patient at some other facility, like an urgent care or a freestanding ER, if the doctor there has said, hey, we need to do an interfacility transport, I'd like you to go to such and such facility. But if the patient suddenly is saying, no, screw that, I don't wanna go, uh, you've got to get on the phone with your medical director and see how they want to proceed, okay? I'm sure they're going to want to have some kind of conversation with either the patient or the doctor um, to see what's probably the best thing for them. Again, emancipated minors, anybody less than 18, they've got to have paperwork there. Um, one of the tricky situations, if you have a pregnant teenager, uh, that teenager can make decisions as it relates to the pregnancy However, she cannot make decisions for herself because she's still a minor. So you're gonna to have to have those um, soon-to-be grandparents to make decisions for the pregnant mom. And then it, it gets tricky because we know obviously the pregnancy absolutely affects mom. Um, so again, if there's any ever any doubt or any problems, call the doctor, okay? <clears throat> All these high-risk refusals, ones that are gonna have cardiac dysrhythmias, chest pains, tasers, uh, any kind of head injuries, overdose, poisoning, pregnancy, seizures, <clears throat> uh, syncopal episodes, drownings or submersions, and hypoglycemia. Under abuse, just keep in mind that as EMS personnel, we are mandatory, like required to report what we might suspect, okay? Within our documentation, make sure that we're keeping it strictly about the medical perspective, what we assess, what we see, if, it, if we're putting anything in there that was stated by a patient or bystander, uh, make sure it's in quotes and document who said it. Uh, but as far as the investigation goes, remember, we're not there to point fingers. That's going to be left to law enforcement, uh, not for us. But if you suspect abuse, make sure that we are reporting it. Document what you find. Uh, let the nurse know your suspicions when you transfer care. And there's going to be some other documents that we probably need to follow up with. And of course, law enforcement, PD should always be called. <clears throat> These are some of those areas, some high index of suspicion that you'd think maybe some abuse is going on. So four years and under, if they're having any kind of weird markings, bruises, injuries in those areas, um, something to think about, okay? Unfortunately, abuse is a very real issue. All right, under pain management. Now, if we are to give somebody fentanyl, ketamine, uh, morphine, something for pain. You got to make sure that they are not hypotensive, they're not hypoxic, they're not underventilated, um, and they're not in active labor. If they're already in active labor, it's too late. Um, all of these pain drugs, morphine, fentanyl, ketamine, even though fentanyl and ketamine are supposed to be safer, okay, and more stable, um, and in a hemodynamically unstable patient, all of those can actually run a risk of dropping pressures, dropping respiratory drives, of course, their mentation, okay? So make sure that we're actually giving fluids, we're giving pressors, we're getting their blood pressures up. Make sure that we're getting them oxygenated, ventilated properly if needed. Get those O2 sats up. Um, and of course, ventilation always needs to be considered. Um, as far as pain management goes, we've got morphine, 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. We can give two to five milligram increments up to a max of 15, okay? In the past, we're used to going up to 20. I mean, we're technically up to 10, but we were allowed to go to 20 if we really needed it. Maybe like a burn patient, okay? Uh, however, now we're only allowed to go to 15. If you needed to give more, because we carry 20, you would just have to call and patch for that, okay? And of course, reassess every five minutes. <clears throat> now, fentanyl, same, one mic per kilo. We've had that intranasal, IV, IO. Uh, we're gonna go a max of 100 micrograms per dose, okay? We do carry 300 mics, but we're only allowed to give 200. So if we want to give that extra 100, got a patch for it. Now, ketamine, this has been added. I'm super excited. Uh, ketamine is great in low doses for pain management, okay? Um, so if you're one that really has a problem giving narcotics to people um, with such a, such a problem that we have out there now with the overdoses, uh, ketamine is a good alternative, okay? I know for me, for example, we had a patient uh, with severe sciatic nerve issues 
where she was completely laid up in bed, could not get out, screaming in pain. We were going to give her fentanyl just so we can get her moved and transported, and she freaked out. Um, come to find out, she's a recovered addict, narcotic, from narcotics. And so we decided to give her ketamine. At the time, we didn't have the protocol, um, but I'm used to using it in other agencies. So I called the doctor and asked, and he was like, yeah. And at the time, we gave 10, mill 10 milligrams. But for our protocols now, 0.25 milligrams per kilogram IVIO for a max dose of 25 milligrams at a time. And we can do that up to 100 milligrams total, okay? So it'll be awesome. It works pretty quickly, especially if you go IV, give it 30 seconds, minute tops, and they're going to be high as a kite, okay? Now, with these protocols, if the column runs all the way across, okay? So like right here, we can see it goes all the way across, whereas down here, we have a left and a right section, okay? If it runs all the way across, that means that protocol is for everybody, okay? If it's divided, you'll see this little these teddy bears here. Again, those are the pediatric protocols, okay? I think what they've done with these protocols is tried to blend a lot of them from adults and peds and put them into one. So in the past, we're so used to a specific adult dose and then a weight-based pediatric dose. Well, now they've made just about everything weight-based so it fits both adult and peds, okay? Now, some of the protocols might be a little tricky, okay? So like for... Um, some of the protocols, uh, let's say the seizures, we're only allowed to give up to four milligrams IV, uh, where we used to give five. Well, the question's been asked, why are we dropping a milligram? Like, what's the big difference between four and five? Well, for an adult, not a big deal. For a kid, an extra milligram of Versed is a big deal, okay? So, um, again, it's just because of that blending issue. I think it's gonna, be, it's gonna be a learning curve for us to retrain our brain now, but in the long run, I think it'll be better for us because now we only have to remember one dose, not two separate doses, okay? <clears throat> All right, moving on. General medical. We get to our syncope, pre-syncope. Uh, try to give fluids a uh, max of 30 milliliters per kilo. For kids, 20 per kilo. Remember, if a uh, kid's blood pressure is low, we try to use that push-pull method. <clears throat> For strokes, they've added pediatrics here, okay? It's pretty unlikely that a kid's gonna have a stroke, but anything's possible. So if you truly believe that all the stroke symptoms are there and it is a child, I would call the facility that is the closest stroke center to you and ask them if they will take that pediatric. Um, chances are, at least where I'm at, they're probably gonna wanna push you to PCH anyway um, or to county, but uh, they might take them. So it's worth calling them and asking, okay? Under altered mental status, of course, we want to consider overdoses and the use of narcotics. Now, with Narcan, a lot of these protocols have EMT listed here now, as well as the medics, okay? Um, EMTs, per these protocols, are allowed to give Narcan if they've had special training here, okay? Um, for our agency, we are not allowing the EMTs to give Narcan, which is kind of frustrating because our cops can give it, but we can't. So just be aware, you may see the cops give it, you might see a family member give it to a patient, um, but basically there's gonna be nasal sprays or an auto injector, kind of like the EpiPens. <clears throat> Maybe one day the EMTs will be able to do it. Now for our dosing, it's gonna be 0.4 to two milligrams, IV, IM, or IN, okay? For kids, it's gonna be 0.1 milligram per kilo. Remember when we're giving Narcan, the goal is just to give them enough to where they start breathing on their own. Okay, the goal is not to slam them with Narcan and snap them awake. Uh, we know that's going to send them into like instant withdrawals, uh, vomiting, um, bowel movements. They're going to be combative. Okay, um, I think it's funny. Some I hear a lot of people teach that uh, patients are combative because they're pissed because you take their high away. Not so much that I've seen in my case. Usually, you slam the Narcan, they pop awake, and they. They're scared. Imagine if you were dead asleep, almost literally, and you snap awake, and there's just a bunch of people towered over you. You'd probably freak out initially too, okay? They have no idea what's going on, so of course they're combative. Um, and we know that giving Narcan, it's so different with everybody. I can give one milligram to one person, 
doesn't touch them, give it to another person, they snap away. Okay, so always be prepared, have them semi-restrained, have control of their hands or feet, because um, we don't want to be fighting them when they wake up. Okay, but remember, just enough to make them start breathing. With our seizures, of course, any altered patient, we want to make sure that we're checking blood sugars, okay? Um, typically with adults and kids, we're going to start treating hypoglycemia if they're less than 60 on their sugar. Uh, if it's a neonate, remember birth to 28 days, uh, if their sugar is less than 40, then we're going to start treating for hypoglycemia. But for the seizures, we're allowed to give Versed 0.2 milligrams per kilogram intramuscular or intranasally. And again, it goes across the protocol, so this is both for adults and kids. If uh, your patient is less than 40 kilos, we can give a max of 5, either IM or IN. Um, and if they're greater than 40 kilos, we can give up to 10. Now, if we're going to go IV, it's only 0.1 milligram per kilogram okay, of Ativan and Versed. Make sure that we're giving it nice and slow. We don't want to slam these drugs. That's when you're going to run the risk of having some hypotensive event or some respiratory compromise. Okay. Now, in this one, like I mentioned earlier, it's a max single dose of 4 milligrams. We're used to giving 2.5 to 5, um, at least for adults, IV, and that's not the case anymore. Just a max of 4. Remember, we can always give more. If the seizure doesn't stop, then we can reevaluate and maybe we can give a little bit more. Okay. Now, under the seizure protocol, you have the um, eclamptic patient. Okay. So, third trimester, pregnant lady, starts seizing. Um, this can also occur up to six weeks postpartum, okay, which you wouldn't typically expect, um, but it's possible. So we would give a mag sulfate, and these protocols say four grams slow IV IO over five minutes. There ain't nobody going to be sitting here pushing an IV for five minutes, okay? Usually what happens is maybe 30 seconds or a minute, you feel like it was really slow, that's that's too fast. We don't want to be pushing mag on somebody like that, okay? Um, remember, mag can become toxic. It can cause some respiratory problems, so we want to give it kind of slow. I would highly recommend um, when you have drugs that are saying to go over 5, 10, 15 minutes, those need to be infused, okay? So put it in a 50cc bag, run your infusion formula, and then drip it in appropriately, okay? <clears throat> All right, hypoglycemia, like I said on the right, we can see here uh, birth to one month, less than 40. If they're one month and older, we're going to go less than 60. Then we can start treating them, okay? Now, they do recommend giving um, glucose, oral glucose initially if we need to, 25 grams PO. Now, keep in mind, our little tubes are typically 15 grams. So, I mean, if you were to give two of those, technically we would be giving 30 grams, which is more than our protocol says. What's an extra five grams? It ain't going to hurt them, okay? Um, <clears throat> but give them a couple tubes, all right? With the kids, we're supposed to give them 0.5 to 1 gram per kilo uh, orally, up to a max of that adult dose of 25 grams, okay? Uh, so just a little less than two tubes. <clears throat> If we're gonna give somebody dextrose and we pop them awake or any kind of sugar and now they're completely coherent, they're alert, awake, all that stuff is fine, they don't wanna go to the hospital. Um, here's some of the criteria that we gotta meet. Uh, biggest one being they gotta have a blood sugar greater than 80, to make sure that they're well informed that the sugar we gave them is fast acting and it could drop and really need to ensure that that patient eats something of, of good substance, okay? <clears throat> if it's their first time diabetic event, I highly recommend they go Okay. Now with our dextrose, if we have to go IV, we can also go IO. Um, it's highly, highly recommended for adults that we use D10. Okay. For kids, definitely use D10. Uh, remember the way that we're going to mix D10, take a 250cc bag, we're going to waste 50cc's out of it, and then we're going to take our amp of our 25 grams of dextrose, put it into our bag, shake it up. And then for adults, we're just going to run that whole bag in. You can go wide open on it with 10 drop, okay? With kids, <clears throat> it's only 5 cc's per kilo. In the past, we've been able to give 5 to 10 cc's per kilo, but now they're wanting us just to stick with 5, okay? Um, for adults, we are still allowed to give D50. Um, so if you have somebody that's totally gorked out, blood sugar is like just reading low, super low, 
um, you may want to go ahead and just push it but just be very careful that we have a very good IV um, because dextrose can be pretty necrotic to the tissue so we don't want to blow that IV all right uh, if we can't get an IV, we can still get glucagon, one milligram, IM or IN. Uh, and for the kids, if they're less than 20 kilos, we're going to cut that in half to 0.5 milligrams. Now here's a new one. Uh, if you have a diabetic who is altered and they have an insulin pump, we are to stop the, in stop the insulin pump and disconnect at the insertion site. Now if a patient is alert, their GCS is 15, ANL4, um, but you can tell they're just not feeling well and their sugar's a little low. Uh, they want us to leave that insulin pump in place. So only remove it if they are altered. For the hyperglycemia, a quick note in here too, a lot of these protocols at the very top will have includes and excludes. Okay, So who does this pertain to and who is not a candidate for this protocol? Okay. <clears throat> Typically with hyperglycemia, we're going to start treating them when they hit that sugar of 250 or greater. Okay, uh, And really the only treatment we have, because we can't give insulin, is going to be fluid boluses. So we're just trying to flush them out. Okay, And we know some of the signs of DKA, those three Ps, one of those being polyuria, uh, they're probably going to be um, a little hypovolemic anyway. So let's get them some fluid boluses, 20 cc's per kilo for adults and 10 cc's per kilo for kids. Now, one of the things I don't like is this example right here, hyperkalemia. There is not a specific protocol for hyperkalemia. It's actually found under hyperglycemia, okay? So this would be one of those examples where if you're going through the app trying to find a tab that says hyperkalemia, you ain't gonna find it. So you'd have to go to either the search option or if you remember with hyperkalemia, we at least need to give calcium chloride Maybe go to the drug profile, type in calcium, and then it should pop up the protocol here for hyperkalemia or where to find it. Okay. Now, calcium gluconate is the preferred medication for this. We are not going to carry that. So in lieu of, we're going to use calcium chloride. Okay. Uh, later in the protocols, we'll talk about some of those indications for hyperkalemia. Um, there's some pretty good uh, QRS type complexes, some strips that will show you those peaked T waves, dampened P waves. Um, and that widening QRS. So those are the EKG changes we're looking for. Calcium gluconate, we don't have calcium chloride we're going to give. So typically for adults, it's probably going to end up being a full amp of that. Uh, and then if they, if we can, we're going to start now albuterol, SVN, five milligrams. Okay. If they're conscious, do your standard bite block type SVN. If for whatever reason you had to intubate this patient, then yeah, we can still do an inline SVN on that. With the kids, Calcium chloride is going to be 20 milligrams per kilo, or you can also say that as 0.2 cc's per kilo. Remember, IV IO over five minutes, max dose of one gram. Um, do not exceed, on either case here, one milliliter per minute. So, this is another drug that you probably want to put in a 50 cc bag and run it over five minutes. It's probably going to be way easier than you sitting here with your stopwatch trying to tap a drug in at a good rate, okay? <clears throat> Albuterol is the same for kids on that. With anaphylaxis, remember, uh, if they have their own auto injector, we want to give that first, um, just to save us some time. Remember, there's adult and pediatric ones, uh, so make sure we're given the right one. And when we look at kids' blood pressures, remember the formula, minimum systolic blood pressure is 70 plus two times the age. So if I had a two-year-old, two times two is four, plus 70. 74 is the lowest systolic pressure. If they're less than that, they're shocky. They're hypotensive, okay? <clears throat> so under anaphylaxis, we've got our epinephrine. Uh, in these protocols, we used to be so used to seeing epi as either one to 1,000 or one to 10,000. They don't write it that way anymore. You'll, what you'll see here is epinephrine one milligram per milliliter. Well, which one is that? Oh, it's 1 to 1,000, right? So it's just written different. Totally the same drug, though. Uh, we know that we can give up to 0.3 milligrams IM, mid-lateral thigh. So for adults, 0.3. For kids, uh, typically we cut that in half. For the little guys, 0.15 milligrams IM. If they're greater or equal to 25 kilos, then it would be 0.3 milligrams 
anterior lateral thigh. Uh, we can repeat epi as needed every 5 to 15 minutes. So if our first IM doesn't work, 5 minutes later we can give another one. Okay, just keep reevaluating your patient. We can give our albuterol, nebulize, and then we can also nebulize epinephrine. Okay, so albuterol, we're, a lot of these albuterol protocols are actually going to include two of those bullets. I think we're really used to giving one um, at a time, so the 2.5 milligrams, but now we're going to give 5 milligrams albuterol SVM and or epinephrine 1 to 1,000, 5 milliliters or 5 milligrams of that. Okay. Um, and if you want to put them both in the same one, if they're really bad, have at it, okay? Not a big deal. But typically, albuterol is going to be for the wheezing, um, and then epinephrine is going to be for that strider, okay? Of course, we want to get Benadryl on board, one milligram per kilogram, IV, IM, or orally, up to a max of 50 milligrams, and lots and lots of fluids, okay? 60 cc's per kilo IV. Um, that's a lot of fluid. But remember, with anaphylaxis, their biggest problem is going to be a lot of vasodilation. Okay, so definitely in shock, fill the tanks. And then if their pressures are not responding to our treatments that we've given up to this point, then you're going to refer back to shock. And that's where our push dose epi is going to come into play. And here we are with shock. We'll do this one and then we'll take a break. So under shock, uh, I highly recommend you go back to our YouTube channel under Medic Junkies and look at Push Dose Epi. Uh, we'll talk further in that video about uh, maps, how to calculate it, when to give Push Dose Epi, uh, how to mix it. There's videos on how you're going to draw. Uh, just remember the saying, if you have a code Epi and a flush, remember, waste one, pull one, give one. Okay. I mean, Technically, you can give one to two cc's of your Push Dose Epi, but the easiest way to remember Waste one, pull one, give one, okay? Uh, we're gonna give lots of fluids, 30 cc's per kilo for adults and kids uh, in less than 15 minutes. So remember to use those pressure bags and the push-pull method uh, with the pediatrics. And there's another video on the, the Medic Junkies channel also. So with push dose, with adults, we're allowed to give 10 to 20 micrograms, which once you mix it in your 10 cc syringe, that would be one to two cc's and we're to give that every two minutes as long as their MAP remains under 65. Now, how do we get the MAP? If you get an automated blood pressure, there's gonna be a number in parentheses right next to your blood pressure. That is your MAP. A normal MAP should be about 80 to 100. When it gets less than 60, we stop perfusing the brain adequately. So once that MAP drops less than 65 and we're getting fluids already, start getting your push dose epi ready. Every two minutes, give them a bump another one, another one. If they're not responding well to one cc, start giving them two cc's at a time, okay? Now with our kids, we can give one to 10 microgram boluses or 0.1 up to one cc's every two minutes. Now, if it's a little kid, personally, if they're really shocky, I would probably give them about 0.5 uh, cc's, see how they respond, and if they're not responsive to that um, five mics, then I'm gonna go ahead and give them the full 10 mics or one cc at a time. Okay, um, but there's really not like a weight-based dose on that. It's just give them 0.1 to 1 cc. Another thing that's kind of hidden in here, uh, adrenal insufficiency. Now, if a patient has hydrocortisone or solucortef prescribed, um, they want us to use their medication. Okay, that's what they need. If they're greater than 12 years old, give them 100 milligrams IM. On the right side there with the pediatrics, you can see that there's different ages and you'll either give 25, 50, or 100 milligrams IM. Um, if you don't have hydrocortisone, like you typically probably won't, um, give them a solumedrol, two milligrams per kilogram, IV, IO, up to the max of 125 that we do for adults. All right, with that, we're gonna conclude part two. We'll be back for part three.